Arnie, DVM, MS, and MPH. I think that's public health, right? Owens Canton Animal Hospital LLC in Canton, Connecticut, and is president of the Connecticut Veterinary Medical Association. He developed the CT uh, SART disaster response program and the Companions in Crisis domestic violence program. Since 2004, Dr. Goldman has served on a variety of emergency preparedness and response committees, task forces, and work groups at local, state, and national levels. He also serves on the board of directors for the National Alliance of State, Animal, and Agriculture Emergency Programs, Americans for Medical Progress, and is currently the AVMA delegate from Connecticut. Dr. Goldman has been instrumental in passing the public acts regarding pets in disasters and controlling the burgeoning animal importation industry. The Connecticut Veterinary Medical Association named Dr. Goldman Veterinary of the, Veterinarian of the Year in 2008. He's also on Adrian Hochstedt's um, State Advocacy Committee. Yep, and then loss of trust in the advisors they have, perhaps including their veterinarians sometimes, and just confusion as to how it all works. I think that's pretty obvious that uh, animal rights advocates and the organizations they represent thrive on the confusion. And so um, I'll, I'll go back now and, and talk a little bit about animal health. After Katrina, there was a number of articles published. Uh, here's a couple of them. I'm just talking about heartworm and parasitic diseases and viral diseases that are found in animals that were displaced. Well, the word displaced, you could argue, is a euphemism for transported, as what Patty has called, humane uh, relocation. And from time to time, I've used the word trafficking, which has a more negative connotation. So uh, there was no question that there were disease issues among the animals being imported into Connecticut. And just to show you that I'm not um, sort of making it up, as I've been accused of on a number of blogs that um, don't like me very well. Um, here's Amber, this is my patient, <clears throat> came to me looking like this right off of the rescue wagon on a Monday, it was picked up on a Sunday from a commuter parking lot uh, with demodicosis. And the photograph on Pet Finder um, apparently didn't show it because the fur covered a lot of that skin and the owner didn't expect it. And when the dog arrived with a disease that was very likely to be incurable, um, they weren't happy about it and it cost them a lot of money. And you know, this is about as good as it got. If you look closely at the muzzle, there's still red areas at the ankles and feet. And right now the, do the dog got more mature and the immune system as well, and I think the dog's doing a little better. But this person had no idea what they were getting. And I, and I personally have seen maybe two dozen, not all Demodex, but two dozen animals um, that arrived sight unseen with diseases that weren't disclosed. It was a bit of a wild west out there. Um, and, uh, and, and I'll talk about a couple individual cases as we go along. And so, you know, when I first made this presentation, the next slide shows you the reason why I put these slides up. Uh, the people involved in this sort of interstate transport and rescue, they take a certain bravado and good feeling from it, and they don't care about the consequences very much. And, and so it reminds me a lot of these old 1930s era movie bills where there's, there's lawlessness and daring associated with it. They know they're doing something they really shouldn't be doing, but because it's for a good cause, you know, they do it. And there's actually one transport um, company that calls itself the dog runner, which is what made me research the two previous handbills in the first place. And the way it was working prior to uh, the Connecticut Veterinary Medical Association taking action um, was that uh, an individual with a laptop at a kitchen somewhere in Connecticut could go on Pet Finder, find a dog there that they thought they could place, make their own web page, advertise the dog, have an owner, you know, future potential owner respond, and then they'd broker the dog by paying whoever had it where its origin was, whether it was a shelter, they'd bail it out of there, or they'd buy it, or whatever, and then the animal would be placed on one of these transports for a fee, which I'll get into, and then it would arrive at a commuter lot where the intended owner would pick it up showing the receipt they had. The person at the kitchen table never had possession of the animal, indeed never saw or touched the animal. And so all the regulations that were in, in place to oversee uh, the way animals were handled, the USDA certificates, the uh, 
uh, Connecticut laws, the Connecticut pet lemon laws, to some degree or other, all of that was being circumvented. And the animals were distributed at 7 a.m. on Sunday mornings at vacant commuter lots to avoid any scrutiny by anybody. And that's what was going on in huge numbers. I mean, now we have no actual numbers to rely on because of the law that got passed. And we know that 14,000 dogs were shipped in the rescue pipeline in 2012. Um, putting that into perspective, less than 3,000 puppies were sold by pet stores. Yet activists are going after the pet stores yet again, and we'll get into that as well. So I'm trying to stay on my time here. So here is the, uh, the what ended up happening was after the Connecticut VMA board agreed to let me look into this, my hospital manager and I staked out this parking lot one Sunday morning, and this is before anybody got there uh, with, with a hot coffee and, and a running car. And an hour later, this is what we had. At 7.30, probably 60 to 75 people lined up anticipating the arrival of Peterson Express Transport Services, the largest East Coast um, commercial driving operation that moves vast numbers of animals uh, up and down the coast. And uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to go too far on tangents because of my time. So uh, the, uh, the transport arrived uh, just at 8 o'clock still quite cold and the people were kind of held back behind some cones and what I noticed was that uh, the people adopting the dogs were grouped into small groups by who the, their contact was, who the individual presenting themselves as a rescue organization was um, and, and, and so whatever money had to change hands, a lot of it occurred in those private groups and then this rig showed up, you'll notice it's a it's a big uh, Chevy with dually wheels, so that's a $60,000 truck. And then you got a trailer that's you know, specially constructed inside that might be worth another thirty to forty thousand. So that's a hundred thousand dollars worth of, of of gear there. Something has to pay for that equipment, you know. And it's it's registered with DOT. You can see the license numbers on the bottom of the sign and the inset. Just kind of keep that in mind. And then uh, once everybody was set up, the people got in an orderly line and they showed their receipts or they paid their money. And I was sort of standing off to the side trying not to be noticed uh, too much because I had no business being there. And then the animals started coming off the trailer. And I noticed that there were young puppies as well as some old dogs. You can see this old lab on the right that has a pot belly and kind of thin hair coat and a gray muzzle. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's no shortage of older dogs like that in Connecticut already. And I just kind of took note of it and, and kind of went on my way. And so, just so you know, I mean, this is part of the website of this Peterson Express Transport Services. It's a legitimate driving company. Um, but they've got ninety dollars or $100,000 invested in this equipment, and he's got six or seven rigs like that and with other drivers working for him. So it's a huge industry. And the people involved, many of whom have, are, are altruistic and have a good nature, they don't really make a connection between this, that if what they're involved in can produce income like this, somebody's making money at it, and therefore it is a commercial enterprise. And so it, it's presented as altruism, but it's managed as a business. Uh, you can't see it too well, but on the left in red is a list of the states and the days they're there. And on Saturday is when they go to the Northeast. So there's this rotation of driving across the southern states, no offense to the south. I've been accused of being some kind of northern to southern bigot, and that is not true. Um, I, I enjoy being in the south, and uh, you know, anyway, we'll get into that uh, later. But so this is what they're doing, and then they, they drop the animals off at nondescript parking lots and Walmart parking lots and that kind of thing. Same thing that we saw in Glastonbury. And that's one way this whole industry had been working unrestricted. And then it, this happens to be the new, a new page from the calendar. It shows th this person is working, making so much money at this that he can take the law, fourth week of the month off every month. Uh, he works three and, uh, and off one. I think that's pretty good. I might look into that. Another way that um, shelter animals from other states were coming into Connecticut is with adoption events. And there was one particular gentleman named Fred Acker who has uh, had a lot of trouble with uh, the law now. Um, but in cooperation with big box retailers that don't sell puppies and kittens, like Petco and PetSmart, for example, um, they would host, either in their store or in vacant stores adjacent to their store, events where individuals like this Mr. Acker could 
rent a, a rider truck, do the same sort of thing, drive to whatever state, empty out a shelter somewhere and then come back and then bring the animals in and, and people would show up at the event which has been appropriately advertised and, and line up and, uh, and buy these animals, calling them adoptions. Had an interesting conversation last night with some people at a table and you know, adoption is another one of those sort of uh, loaded words that has been put into the vernacular, um, but what does it really mean? So here is my second field investigation, my hospital manager and I, <coughs> Kristen Ludwicko, who is a uh, Rottweiler fancier, and uh, you know, she feels the same as I do, so we sort of did this together as a project. Anyway, so this is in the morning, lined up outside a vacant storefront, Petco provided the signs and probably paid the rent on the store. You know, and it makes sense to them. They'll sell a lot of supplies. This is what it was like inside. Makeshift cages on tarps with some uh, sawdust and all, and, and the people milled around deciding which, if any, animals they were going to purchase. And you can kind of see how organized it was. There were tables and all the things necessary. This was well thought out and the animals were sold for various amounts of money in excess of $150, enough to rent the truck, pay the gasoline, and whatever else staff this gentleman had to hire. It's called SPCA of Connecticut, but it's a one-man operation. And you can see him sitting there um, talking to people. One of the things I heard him say, I couldn't get that close, was, you know, this is a, uh, uh, where is as is, you know, we won't take the animals back, because he had no facility at all. SPCA of Connecticut was a, some, some letterhead and a computer in this gentleman's home. It wasn't like he owned any kind of a facility. So from the truck in the back, there was no place for them to go except to the public right away. And this, this operation got shut down. And Petco was proud to put their banner behind there. Nobody had to ask. So. I've been asking this question since I became aware of this issue is the focus seems to always be on remediation. Let's ship the animals from the southern states or midwestern states to the northeast where they got a lot of money, you know, those Yankees, and, um, and that way people will get them and we won't have to euthanize them and we also won't have to educate our citizens or do any hard work to limit the wandering and the unintended reproduction that goes on. And, um, I, I, think, I think a significant proportion of those involved, at least at the higher levels, know that there's a lot of money in this. There really is a lot of money in this. And, and you know, the regionally high euthanasia numbers leads to good PR for the organizations. After all, they're saving lives, right? And so the high transport numbers translate into serious money over a period of time over a lot of animals. <clears throat> we referred to emotionally manipulative terminology the word rescue has a real different meaning uh, in the animal world than it does in uh, the real world. And there's a lot of terms like that. And so look, look where we've gotten to. Uh, it was addressed, somebody said something last night at the table about these and I put this slide in uh, at that time. Uh, it's really not the same. I mean, we can love our animals, um, but I have come, I, I've come a long way. I mean, I'm a Northeastern guy. I, I grew up in New York and I uh, was a small animal veterinarian and going into veterinary school, you know, I, I, don't, I think I was one of the people that didn't understand these issues at all and having passed through three decades of this, I sort of get it now and, um, and I think it's, it's wrong of us as a society to try to elevate animals to the same moral status as humans. And I think even our, my profession is confused and, and conflicted with this because we want to provide services at the level at which is medically possible and we're trained to do, but to do that you have to have people willing to spend and therefore they have to have the commitment. But at the same time we're trying to say this far and no further. And I think especially among my younger colleagues and the demographic that's coming through now, it's, it's a difficult argument to make and I, I think only decades of maturing may help some of them cross that divide. I, I don't know. So I'm gonna be quick with this. Um, these are some of the websites that advertise rescue dogs. It is sad that we must send our homeless dogs hundreds of miles into other states. So they acknowledge that they're not doing enough at home. And then they're bigoted about their own origins. Southerners have excellent taste in dogs, they just don't spay and neuter or keep them on their property. Well, why not? They're no less intelligent or capable than us. If it's a matter of money, okay, I can understand some of that. 
And then another comment is enterprising souls on both sides are making this market work. There's acknowledgement that there's money in it. And adoption fees, <coughs> so-called, run in that neighborhood depending on the breed and the age and the training, if any. And so you go to see, well, if Mr. Peterson gets 100 and a quarter or 175 for doing the transport and the veterinarian at the origin gets 50 or 75 bucks an exam, um, there's still some money left over for the kitchen table person to, um, to make out and, and maybe use some of it for donations to perhaps some other organizations. Um, the, the contracts are not, not unfamiliar, but they also are explicit about what the refund will be and what's going to happen. So rescue organizations are no less um, self-protective, perhaps, than other sources of getting animals. There's disclaimers. We cannot guarantee that future health issues will not arise. Well, yeah, it's a living creature. And any source you get it from, things can happen. So, uh, and now we've got the foster care issue where organizations, maybe the person at the kitchen table or three people that meet for coffee over a kitchen table know that they can't get away with having more than six or eight dogs in their household. In Connecticut, most municipalities call you a kennel if you have more than six dogs in your personal home. So sometimes you get away with it and sometimes you don't, depends on how rural you live. So this foster care idea takes over where the rescue organizations, one or more individuals, understand that to have the income keep flowing, they've got to have the product readily available for the events and whatever else they're going to hold. So they warehouse the animals as individuals across a network of people that can only commit so much. They can't take on more animals, but they can hold one for a few months or six months. And then a further permutation on it is this sub-fostering, where now you have people that agree to take an animal for a month or less, but if you have a hundred of them, that gets you a year or more uh, of holding several animals sort of sight unseen out of the, uh, the public eye. So it is big business. Uh, here's a quote from Peterson, and I don't mean to single this person out. There's about two dozen of these organizations on the East Coast, and I know that it goes on in California and also towards the Great Lakes region, and probably in other areas that I'm just unaware of. And an interesting thing about it is it goes in both directions because the organizations have figured out that the dog you can adopt in your state for $25 from the local shelter is worth $400 or $500 if you ship it three states over and call it a rescue for whatever reason. So they're moving back and forth. But admittedly, it's, it's mostly south to north for various social, social reasons. And so, it's big business. I, I, I guess this is a redundant slide. Another little permutation that just interests me, because I'm a pilot, is that uh, there are three, at least three pilot organizations moving dogs for you know, just cost. And all of that technically violates the FAA rules on running commercial enterprises. But you know, if you were to rat somebody out, of course, that makes you inhumane. But I, I gathered this info because I actually know one of these people. And I did try to talk to them. and. They weren't interested in hearing the truth. So, uh, There's a lot of irony in this whole thing. Um, here's a quote from uh, a rescue organization's website. Having each and every animal we transport spayed and neuter is very important to us. We don't want to create the overpopulation problem we have down here in the south up in the north, especially since it can't, can easily be prevented. So they are acknowledging that we don't have an overpopulation problem in Connecticut. And of course, if we're importing 14,000 rescue dogs a year, I mean, uh, it's just, it's just it's ludicrous. Um, and then here is their excuse for why um, the conditions in certain states just don't uh, lead to people being responsible. I think people, if they're not responsible, maybe it's because no one ever told them they had to and tried to make them have to. Um, you know, I won't read it to you, but th this is right from their websites. Um, and, and, and again, uh, this is the same website. So, and, and this one addresses um, that there's people breeding puppies casually, and then they're just giving them to rescue organizations for some small amount of money, which is magnified up the supply chain, and everybody makes out. And, and nobody thinks there's anything wrong with that. Y meanwhile, it's portrayed by the large animal rights organizations as some sort of heroic thing that this vast network is operating in. And a, lo a lot of it's not, just not true. 
Um, and then, and here's the connection. This is an ASPC or an American Humane Association seal of approval direct to this transport organization. There is a connection. There's cross pollination between people on boards of directors and donations and all of that. So, what do we do in Connecticut? In Connecticut, um, after these photographs of the parking lot and the, and the storefront event were shown to my board of directors, they, uh, they agreed that we should try to do something about it. Rarely does a, a veterinary medical association proactively, a state VMA, proactively pursue legislation. Mostly, we try to stop bad things from happening. Because you, when, when you promote something, there's plenty of opportunity for people to jump on the bandwagon and change it, and maybe give you something you never intended in the first place. So we tend to be kind of conservative that way, hold back, stay out of the public eye unless something really egregious is going to happen. And we only really have two directions we can go in that uh, makes us successful when it comes to dealing with government. One is protecting our own interests. Everybody understands that protecting your own interests is something that you have to do. And then the other place where legislators and the public would actually listen is when animal health is threatened uh, and we can make a convincing case that it's so. Any other issue, uh, VMA, proactive legislation is doomed. It's just we're not respected in those other ways. So what we did was we approached our lobbyist, who in turn approached a sympathetic legislator who had an agricultural background, and we, uh, I gave a presentation similar to this, and, and, and the gentleman was convinced, and so this initial uh, draft legislation was proposed. And you'll note it says the title, an act extending certain pet shop licensee requirements to persons and organizations that import animals for adoption. Just the proposal alone drove the people who it was to affect into angry fits. It was, it was unbelievable. The idea that anybody would accuse them of being anything like a pet shop needing regulation, just they could hardly contain themselves. Spitting anger was the way that I would describe um, their response to seeing that. Um, in managing this, uh, we put uh, articles into local newspapers, uh, and, and so we thought a lot about managing it to our internal audience, which is our own colleagues, and that article's on the right by our executive director, Simon Flynn, and then an article in the Hartford Current and some other papers in Connecticut helped get the word out uh, to the public about it. And this was a, a bitterly fought uh, campaign that, believe me, they did not accept the idea, the, the rescue organizations, that they were going to come under uh, regulation, much like pet shops were. And so our strategies had to be very carefully crafted. And again, as I said, the only realm in which veterinarians are respected, for the most part, is when it comes to animal health. When you get into other issues of advocacy, um, they look at you like, well, what's it to you, you know? And so we sort of understand that on some level. And so we advocated animal health, and, and I won't read every point to you, but these points underneath show the arguments, the, the bullet points in support of the strategies. And so, and, and I've gone over them already. Um, we, of course, we want to promote humaneness because that's essential. We don't want to be seen as being uh, all about money. And one of the arguments that some legislators accepted was, well, if veterinarians were in this, were, were looking to, you know, uh, regulate rescues so that we would make more money in doing the physical exams that were going to be required, wouldn't we just not do it so the sick animals would arrive so we could really treat them for disease? Uh, and, and they sort of got that, that uh, it, it couldn't be about that. But, but even so, after all this time, uh, there's a lot of mad people uh, about this thing. And then we wanted to promote consumer protection. The consumers are our clients. They already have animals. If they're adopting sick animals into their homes and then coming to us with multiple sick animals, you know, that's, that's not good either. And there's supposed to be laws about importing animals. And this operation was so vast, there was nobody overseeing it. The Department of Ag, local State Department of Ag, had no resources for it. So that was another strategy. And then, when people receive animals from out of state, if they do have deformities and illnesses, some proportion of them just can't afford to deal with it. And some of those animals got turned back over to local uh, shelters and rescues. And so the problem was just magnified. And you just heard that 
you know, we really don't have an overpopulation problem in Connecticut. So we're creating one by bringing in animals from other states who are not doing whatever it is they need to do to sort of slow this process down. No offense to any state in particular, um, they come to Connecticut from all, all directions. But uh, it has a number of effects on our own municipal and state animal control agencies uh, listed there. So these were our summary talking points. Uh, we wanted to control disease exposure to Connecticut animals. We wanted to protect consumers by not having surprises when they pick up their animals. Uh, we wanted to limit surrender because we don't want to add to our population. Uh, we did not want uh, importation to be completely uncontrolled in such vast numbers that animals already in Connecticut had no chance of finding homes. And we didn't want to pay for other states allowing of citizen irresponsibility. We can't solve that but we can only avoid enabling it. And then um, we wanted to allow our animal welfare organizations to prosper because on some level they're needed. There's plenty of cats, right? We, this is mostly about dogs. Now we had opposition. Uh, Patty, can I continue? I, I'm, I'm, I know, all right. So um, this organization was formed uh, from a group of activists uh, from national activist organizations that you're familiar with. And uh, it, it, it registered as a PAC, and they had legislators who were allies of it. And uh, they, they just, just as the national organizations do, they try to confuse people uh, about animal rights activism in the guise of homeless pet advocacy. And they're, they're, they're not really the same thing, but if you go through the website and some of their other goals, you can kind of see how that works. Money's donated to their, their organization and constituent organizations, and they advocate for homeless animals, but they also advocate for other things. And so I know Feld is here, and this was an organization that was uh, big in trying to prevent the circus from being in Connecticut. Uh, they put uh, bills in every other year uh, in the long sessions to prevent use of the so-called uh, guides, which they like to call the bull hook, and um, um, they'll probably continue putting legislation in like that. But I think to some extent they're they're somewhat weaker. They, they, they haven't had a big victory in a long time. And they share staff with other organizations. Uh, the current president, uh, Deborah Bresch, is actually paid by ASPCA, but travels to Connecticut from New Jersey regularly to help run this organization. The Northeast is, is a hotbed of activism, as you know. And then we have individual legislators uh, who got themselves involved. Um, th this woman, Representative Urban, uh, is um, now a state senator, and she rode horses in, in college, so she's an unquestioned authority on all aspects of animal welfare. And, <laughs> and in the central photograph, you see her accepting a check from ASPCA uh, that went to Connecticut Votes for Animals. And you know, their, their goals are to um, you know, leave rescue unregulated, uh, eliminate sales of pet stores, eliminate breeding, eliminate the circus, eliminate horseback riding. Now, I, I don't know where she gets all these ideas, but, but we also had a sympathetic legislator, someone with a farming background that definitely got it. And unfortunately, he's moved on to other work, but he did help us get through this effort, Brian Hurlburt, and I have to give him a lot of thanks for promoting the legislation. And when the bill came out of committee, it was unanimous, even Diana Urban, the animal rights oriented legislator had to vote for it because the bill talked about animal health. And so who is gonna come out and say they're against something that's gonna promote animal health? There was really nothing she could do, so she had to vote for it. And when it came to uh, the full legislature, it was almost unanimous. I don't know who the two holdouts were in the House. So this bill passed um, almost unanimously. That's really unusual. We have both well, we, 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 it's mostly a single party legislature in Connecticut. We have a little bit of both, and um, somehow this cross part, nobody wanted to be seen as being against animal welfare. And so this is what we got. We got Public Act 11187, and it exists today, and this is what it does. It requires all rescue organizations that import animals from other places into Connecticut to register with the State Department of Agriculture with a form provided for that purpose and a $100 fee once a year. Um, they have to have a permanent address of service of process in Connecticut. So if a consumer has a complaint, they have to have somebody they can reach with civil penalties um, for not doing what is further described 
um, elsewhere in the regulations about what the animal health is. So essentially the pet lemon law that applies to pet stores applies to them. And they have to, the organizations have to record the numbers, report them once a year, record the origins of the animals, essentially gather the data uh, that Patty and others have talked about that's essential to know what's going on. There's fines for noncompliance, and they gave them an exemption for the foster people as volunteers um, they don't have to also register, but they have to be formally connected to an organization that is registered. Goes on to define the words in our, uh, in our law, what transfer, rescue, and adoption actually mean in Connecticut. And so that way, um, those words can't be muddled. Uh, essentially, they're all defined as a sale if money changed hands in any way. Also, um, the zoning enforcement officer in our municipalities, we're a home rule state, so there's 169 towns and two tribal nations. Each one has a zoning enforcement officer, and that person's in charge of what goes on on private and public property. And if you want to hold an event, like a storefront event in a retail establishment next to a Petco, you're supposed to notify the ZEO 10 days before uh, so that they can look at the location and see that it's appropriate for parking and public facilities. There were no bathrooms available in that event I showed you and that sort of thing. Pet shops were specifically excluded, which also infuriated these people, but because they ignored the fact that pet shops are already heavily regulated by other parts of legislation. Uh, inspection was allowed for, however, the warrantless searches of foster homes it was meant, it mentioned earlier that that's a sticking point. That was excluded, and it would have been excluded anyway. Um, and then the USDA health certificate requirement. You know, boy, I, I caught a lot of vitriol for pointing out that some rescue organizations sort of have very close relationships with individual veterinarians that are probably USDA accredited. And, and that these health certificates are filled out and sometimes the animals that arrive are not the ones that are listed. Sometimes the exams are somewhat cursory. So I'm not accusing my colleagues of anything wrong, but this was the impression one had, that somehow sick animals were arriving yet nothing was being noted on the certificate. Some of the illnesses just couldn't possibly be contracted in the five days they were in transit. So somewhere along the line, something was being expedited. And um, finally, the animals had to be examined immediately upon arrival in Connecticut by a Connecticut licensed veterinarian who had a practice in Connecticut. So in other words, you couldn't have a Connecticut license and live in Florida, say, examine the animal seven days before arrival and that would be considered okay. And they also fought this because they understood that you know, there was gonna be an expense associated with it. And that's where they got the argument to say, well, we vets were in it for the money. And we really weren't. We were just in it to protect our clients first and their animals a close second. But that, that's, that's the impression they had. So here's what the forms look like. Registration form, event form. Uh, the take home messages. Legislators cannot openly ignore animal health concerns. Uh, the public and legislators will listen to us on those issues. Uh, there's a financial motivation in this and the louder they cry there isn't, the more obvious it becomes that there is. Those involved with rescue are also close, uh, let, me, let me rephrase that. Those involved with interstate transport of animals shelter to shelter are often aligned with animal rights uh, advocacy organizations. And they intentionally conflate the messages so that donations flow. They also share leadership and funding, which we've seen with ASPCA and Connecticut Votes for Animals. Um, they are promoting limiting the public's choices. And when the public becomes aware of it, the bulk of them, um, it, it doesn't resonate with them. And veterinary medical associations can be effective, but only if animal health is directly threatened. In other, and, and you know, that's come up a couple of times. Why does the VMA not step in? Some issues are just losers for a VMA. And their, their membership is, is a spectrum of beliefs from perhaps mine to a veterinarian that perhaps works for an animal rights organization. And, and it varies, and, and certainly we see that across our membership. You know, we've got a large, there's 84,000 veterinarians and members of the AVMA. 
some significant proportion of them are vegans or vegetarians. You know, they have certain views. They're just human beings, just like everybody else in society. And then another message is that when you work with other organizations, which we did, we worked closely with Connecticut Dog Federation, had a lot of support from NAIA directly through Patty with literature and other things that would help me uh, convince people. And so we, can, we, did, we did all of that as a coalition. Uh, and I'll just, Patty, am I all right to continue like a couple more minutes or? A couple more minutes, yeah, and she, she's next. So, And then uh, some more irony is after all this was over, they claimed victory as if it was their idea. And they fought it with spitting anger, and yet, and, and you know, the people testifying in the, in, the, in the committee hearings and then in the legislative hearings were, you couldn't believe it how mad they were. I mean, we were pretty calm because, you know, what was the worst that could happen? We'd just try again. Uh, uh, but they claimed victory. I thought that was fascinating. Um, and, and this is my opinion here that, you know, dog surpluses um, exist in certain places. I, I look at it in, in a political way that, you know, it can be resolved one state at a time, but to try to call it a national issue, it doesn't really work that way because the laws control what people can do and the laws are different everywhere. And perhaps culture is different too, I don't know, uh, people, people accuse uh, make that allegation. I, I'm certainly not going to come out and say that. I also find it kind of regionalist to argue that people are more irresponsible and less willing to listen in one place than another. Maybe it's just never been tried. Uh, the aftermath. I know that Dr. Mokarski, in checking up on me recently, saw some of these things. I am considered, now Patty didn't appoint me the mouthpiece for NAIA, but certainly Jim Crow dogs did. And uh, frankly, I find the title of that website offensive. Uh, it, 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 it makes an allusion to uh, certain social issues that uh, I think just doesn't, isn't appropriate. Um, you should be ashamed of yourself. My grandmother probably said that to me a few times growing up. That's another one. Um, and then here we have follow the money. You vet and your ilk will make more cash by selling genetically crippled dogs. Shame on you and the fools. This is what they think of us. Um, I, Connecticut launches a broadside at rescue. This was all going on during the effort to pass the law. And this is the statement of, of, you know, I can't quite get it out of my mind, a dog in need is a dog in need. They don't care about the long-term consequences of their enablement. They only want to do what good, is good now because it feels good now. And, and they're not thinking about the unborn puppies 24 months out you know, that are gonna be in the same cage, moved by the same trailer, coming to the same state. And really what, what, what interested me about this whole issue was the ability to maybe really end overpopulation one day, one state at a time, if, if we can get the states keeping records and, um, and, and be able to make cogent arguments about it. So I guess to them, I've failed to do my duty. And another thing they say is while rescuers do the hard work of keeping them off the street, they, they really have high regard for themselves. Uh, and they believe that veterinarians are in it for the money. So uh, they don't trust our motives. Uh, they see themselves as unquestioned authority on optimal animal welfare. They believe altruism should mute any alternative views and they'll shout you down. Um, they believe that their convenience matters. You know, that an organization that has to rescue, well, that, uh, register rather, that, that's, that's inconvenient. And um, they think the better they, uh, the more they care, uh, the less uh, they should have to pay. Uh, they believe that euthanasia is directly related to breeding and that we're, we're essentially war criminals in their world. And, and they conflate animal welfare issues uh, related to breeding with shelter populations. And, and that's, HSUS in particular is guilty of that, of uh, trying to, you know, their pictures on TV show the sad puppy with Sarah, what's her name, McLaughlin singing, and then, or is that ASPCA? And then, and then yet they advocate on all these other things that have nothing to do with it. So, and this is my final slide, Patty, I'm sorry. Um, so now there's a new, so now there's a new bill, and I'm on a task force looking at it to potentially ban the sale of puppies from pet stores. And puppies from pet stores cost a certain amount and generally it's less than what a home hobby breeder might charge for a dog that they raise. And so they're arguing now that pet stores should t do what's called, they're calling humane sourcing. They should partner with rescue organizations much as Petco and PetSmart actually currently do. And they should s sell those puppies 
um, and and not and not these puppies, uh, the the commercially bred puppies, with the idea that they're going to impact the commercial breeders uh, in other states somehow. And they're not arguing anymore that the puppies from the pet stores are unhealthy. They're just arguing that their parents, the sire and the dam, are sort of inhumanely cared for, and therefore the whole thing stinks and it's not fair. Um, but customers are not interchangeable, and pet store. Uh, customers are looking for a young puppy they can raise of a breed of a known temperament confirmation type or what they had as a child to own themselves and they should be able to do that. So I got put on this task force and uh, the, the legislator in charge of it is for this ban. They won't let me use the word ban. Every time I do they say, oh no, we're not in favor of a ban on pet stores. We want them to engage in humane sourcing. Well. I'm going to, uh, there's one more hearing on November 13th, and I'm going to ask the question. I said, well, when PetSmart and PetGo allow the rescue groups to set up in their stores or next to them, how much, what percentage of the sale adoption price is shared with PetGo and PetSmart? Amen. And I'm guessing it's zero. And so how are they going to do this with, with, with real family businesses that are trying to survive? It's not going to happen. Uh, I have a video. Hi, Benny. We are lucky to live in a world where people love pets, like us. Did you know that many people rescue their pets instead of buying them? Isn't that wonderful? These owners are heroes. Well, Willie, I have heard this, but I must tell you, there's much more to the story than simple heroism. In fact, much of this rescue business is an unfortunate deception. The public has been misled and the truth is, many more animals suffer because of the irresponsibility enabled by Pet Rescue. My word, Benny, I had not heard this. I thought Pet Rescue is wonderful because it gets individual animals into homes they would otherwise not have. I read in the paper, saw on the internet, and also on TV, that many people feel good because they are involved in Pet Rescue and pet owners are proud that they adopted a rescued pet. Is this not all true? It is true that pet owners are proud they adopt rescued pets, and also that many involved in pet rescue feel very good about their actions because they have helped one or more pets, but there is more than meets the eye here Willie. There are many problems with pet rescue, the main one being that citizens in one state pay for the animal welfare responsibility of citizens in other states. The emotional power of unknown animals and the words, rescue, adoption, and, no kill seem to cloud the minds of the public to what is really going on with pets needing homes. Well, what is going on? Why are you so upset about this, and why should I believe you, instead of all the positive things I have read and heard? Well first, the rescue process mostly involves moving animals from one state to another, under the claim that the animals are being saved from euthanasia and so-called, kill, shelters. The fact is all shelters must unfortunately euthanize unadoptable animals sometimes, and those that don't often have restrictive admission policies, so that they do not have to do the difficult and emotionally painful work involved in sorting who lives or dies. These latter, so-called, no-kill, shelters, are really a false premise. But isn't saving lives important? Isn't one life saved worth moving animals from one state to another? This is a debatable point because when animals are moved interstate in the large numbers they now are, many animals already here, wait longer to be adopted, perhaps never are adopted or are themselves euthanized. There are only so many homes able to accept a new pet. Meanwhile in the states where the imported animals come from, weak animal control laws allow unregulated breeding while the number of animals in shelters grow and the numbers needing homes in these states are unlimited. Here where we enforce animal control and responsible pet management, the problem is much less. The result is, we are importing another state's animal control problem and paying for it. This enables those exporting states to continue to ignore, underfund and understaff animal control at home. The result is a net decrease in the number of animals and shelters, and unregulated breeding and euthanasia continue across the country. Nothing heroic in that. So that's the worst of it? No, there's even more. Transported animals are often kept on vans and trucks for days, allowing stress and sickness to spread among them. Some have diseases rarely seen in the northern states where they are most often shipped to, risking illness in animals already there. Some have hidden illnesses and deformities that their soon-to-be new owners do not know about, 
but will have to pay a veterinarian to diagnose and treat. To illustrate this, local veterinarians report a dramatic increase in heartworm disease in northeastern states recently. Heartworm is endemic in the south where many rescue animals originate. The rescue organizations will not be there to pay these costs. In fact, they often cannot be found after the adoption, donation, is paid and the animal is placed. That's because the adoptions occur in commuter parking lots and briefly rented storefronts. The pet lamin law cannot protect the public if the seller, and rescue is in many cases, really a sale, cannot be found. Animal owners often have no recourse when rescue groups and transporters have no fixed address, and they may also feel guilty about complaining about an animal's undisclosed medical conditions. After all, we all agree that being sick is not the animal's fault. Yet some of these animals are later surrendered to animal shelters here, when owners cannot afford treatment. That worsens the situation here in our state. Wow Willie, this rescue business is not what it seems, not at all. Why doesn't the public know all of this? Why don't the media pursue this story? Benny, the public often seems like they just don't want to know the facts. The media likes pet stories that warm hearts and showcases dog-gooders. It's an emotional subject, and complicated to explain. Perhaps the best thing to say to people wanting to adopt a pet is that they ought to think to adopt locally first. It's important that every state do their own work in preventing unwanted litters and getting unknown pets into homes. By allowing the wholesale shipment from state to state, the overall pet overpopulation problem is simply shifted around, but never solved. Every state must devote resources to this problem and teach their own citizens about responsible pet ownership. States with excellent animal control cannot be expected to pick up the costs and the burden for those states that have poor animal control. We should not support enabling continued irresponsibility. In the case of pet rescue, a life saved is most certainly not simply a life saved. This is all sad to hear, Willie. I wish people paid more attention to facts rather than just emotion. The world could be a better place for pets. Oh, that it could be so. Yeah. Uh, f- f- thanks for your attention. I, I, I f- couldn't get that to play before, and I realize now in listening to it that it should have a few corrections. I, I don't think I'd use the word breeder again. I think I'd substitute unintended reproduction or some other phrase. And, and, and I say that because, you know, we're, we're in a room friendly to those who breed dogs, and... Um, I think it's important that people who are engaged in animal welfare as we are um, not disparage others who are engaged in animal welfare with emotional arguments. Uh, I was just, uh, the hearings I've been attending, it's like a triangular firing squad. The, uh, the, the local breeders and the local breed association looks down their nose at the pet stores and the pet stores and their advocates um, are looked down on by the animal, animal rights advocates, and then everybody doesn't like um, them together, you know. And I, and I think one thing's important to keep in mind, and that, and I was discussing it with someone I was sitting with just now, is, you know, yeah, those of you who are home-based or hobby breeders wouldn't uh, sell your dogs to pet stores, but people of modest means have the right to buy a purebred puppy somewhere, and arguably. Um, Most pet store puppies, uh, while not bred with the same, perhaps with the same loving home-based care that some of you do with your two or three litters a year, um, you know, they can be healthy and those families deserve the right to have the dog they want. So there is a certain classism to being against that. And I would caution people involved in the fancy and in breeding to not be so overtly disparaging about their colleagues who supply young dogs to people of modest means. Thank you.